1644, the civil war rages on across England. The forces of Parliament and the King are locked in a brutal struggle for supremacy. Despite the success of the Royalist forces the previous year, the arrival of the Scottish Covenanters threatened to undo all they had gained. It was in the north where Sir William Cavendish, the Marquis of Newcastle, faced the brunt of this new adversary and was trapped in York with the remnants of his army. Although they were well stocked with provisions, it was certain that not only York, but the north itself would fall to Parliament. The King had to act. Charles I tasked the relief of the city to his bohemian nephew, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Upon receiving this new order, Rupert made haste to York and ended up in Lancashire. Fortunately, the towns there were very easy to loot, and so Rupert had a jolly good time ransacking Stockport, Bolton and Liverpool. And just like that, Rupert had all the manpower and supplies he needed to, to relieve York, all according to his rather convoluted plan. But now Parliament knew that Rupert was heading for them, and they would be prepared. The two armies sieging York now became three as the Eastern Association arrived north to join them. Now they clearly held the advantage. All they had to do was prevent Rupert from reaching York, and the North was theirs, and they chose Marston Moor to be the battleground. Here at Marston Moor we shall crush the Devil's Scourge once and for all. Sure, he may be a capable commander, but he couldn't hope to overcome us all without the troops from York. Our plan cannot be faulted. Sire, York's been relieved. What? How did Rupert get past us? He... walked around us? You mean there's more than one way to get to York? Right, we're leaving. See ya, laddies! The relief of the siege was met with celebration as the garrison did the customary tradition of looting the siege camp for treasure. The greatest loot found was 4,000 pairs of shoes, a fitting reward for their great feat. But Rupert was not done yet. He wanted to crush the Allied armies now that they were disorganised and retreating back south. He sent a letter to Newcastle, requesting he march out and combine forces with him. I'm not going to do that. He didn't praise me for holding on to York. I'll let him wait. Prince Rupert could only watch as the swift victory he had planned began to unwind with every passing minute. By midday, he realised that the opportunity to strike had passed. Newcastle and his troops arrived onto the field at 5pm. Both armies had drawn themselves up into formation, expecting a battle. Parliament had positioned their combined force of about 26,000 men along the shallow ridge of Braham Hill, between Long Marston and Tockwith, in the conventional battle formation, with their pikemen and musketeers in the centre and their cavalry on the flanks. The Eastern Association formed the left flank of the army, the Northern Association formed the right flank, and the Scottish Covenators took up the centre and reserve positions. The Royalist army, of about 18,000 men, had adopted a similar formation, but with a force of cavalry in reserve and two regiments of musketeers on each flank to support the cavalry. Both sides then began the waiting game, believing that the other had to go on the attack. Parliament launched a quick artillery bombardment to provoke a battle, but still nothing happened. Prince Rupert had given up on the prospect of a battle and decided to stressy his disappointment away instead. At 7pm, the drums began to thunder across the battlefield and the Allied army began to advance into the moor. To the Royalist soldier, this must have been a terrifying surprise only to be followed by a scramble for musketeers to light their matches and cavalry to remount. The Eastern Association cavalry advanced to attack the unprepared Royalist cavalry. Then why don't we attack them first, said Lord Byron, as he charged off with a fragment of his cavalry. A fierce melee broke out between the Royalist and Parliamentarians, led by a certain Oliver Cromwell. Rupert left mid snack to join the struggle on that flank. Cromwell got a small cut on his neck and left the battlefield with Leslie to finish the cavalry fight, while Crawford tackled the Royalist infantry. Eventually, the Parliamentarian infantry and cavalry both overcame their opponents. Meanwhile, on the other flank, the Fairfaxes had difficulty deploying their cavalry, so Thomas Fairfax would later insist that this was due to a hedge that probably didn't exist, and it was actually Royalist musketeers halting their advance. 
Goring led a more cohesive cavalry charge against the northern horse and broke them from the field. The cavalry rushed on to loot the baggage train, possibly in search for even more pairs of shoes. Ferdinando Fairfax, seemingly unfazed by the loss of his army, returned to his home and went straight to bed. The parliamentarian infantry was doing quite well at this point, but after witnessing the disaster on Fairfax's flank and being attacked by cavalry under Blackiston, many of them decided that this fight wasn't worth it and began to leave in droves. Alexander Leslie tried to stem this tide himself, but found himself getting carried away all the way to Leeds. The only ones to remain were troops under the command of Maitland in the first line and Lumsden in the reserves, who were able to fend off a charge by Sir Charles Lucas, and a second time, and one more time after that. Sir Charles Lucas would probably have been quite embarrassed by this if he hadn't died in the process. By this point, Cromwell had returned to his victorious cavalry along with Sir Thomas Fairfax, who had removed his field sign from his hat to avoid getting captured as he crossed the battlefield and they together led the victorious cavalry in a flank attack on the Royalist infantry. This action proved decisive and drove the Royalists from the field. Only Newcastle's white coats stood their ground against their foes. Whether this was done out of Royalist bravado or to cover the retreat we cannot say. Only 30 of them survived. Goring's cavalry returned from their treasure hunt to discover the day was lost and were forced to flee from the pursuing parliamentarians. Prince Rupert had to spend the night hiding in a bean field before he could regroup with the remnants of his soldiers, deflated over the loss of his army and more importantly, the loss of his dog, Boy. In a matter of two hours, 4,000 royalist soldiers lay dead on the field and 1,500 taken prisoner. Parliament reported 300 killed but the actual figure would definitely have been much higher. York would eventually fall two weeks after the battle and with that, Parliament's supremacy in the North was assured. The war had turned in their favour. Thank you for watching the very first Jammy History video. I hope you enjoyed. If so, then please like and subscribe, and also comment on what topic you'd like me to cover next. See you around.